like Duran said, um, I'm a college student. Towson University has just absolutely changed my life here. Um, being here at Towson has just been an absolutely amazing experience. I've only been here for two years, and I could not be more excited about what the next two years have to offer. I love everything about it, from my classes to my friends to everything that I get to experience on this amazing campus. One thing that I think is really special about college in general, and Towson's definitely not an exception to this rule, is that college campuses are just absolute hotbeds of activism. I mean, you see things happening on college campuses all the time, like Oberlin. You see things happening all over the country, and definitely Towson's not an exception to that. Um, there is always something going on, it seems, that makes you think about what the world could really be like if we all work together to make it a better place. Uh, for example, the Feminist Collective recently had a uh, night walk to show solidarity for uh, survivors of sexual assault. Students Helping Honduras raises tens of thousands of dollars, like it's absolutely, like it's nothing, it's like magic how quickly they raise that money. And those are just two examples. There are always different things going on that really make students want to become involved. So Dr. Lusky, I think, is just the absolute embodiment of that spirit of what Towson University is. Um, she asked us at her inauguration speech recently, you know, what, what is it that you plan to do with this education that 1% of the world gets? And you could just hear this hush over the entire room. Like, 1% of us get this. So I'm really proud to go to a university where a lot of kids are already well on their way to making the world a better place. So these people are a few of my honors classmates. They are from the left, uh, Adam Leatherman, Meredith Walter, myself, and Jeremy Hurtis. Actually, Meredith and Adam are here today, so if they wouldn't mind standing up for just a minute so they can be recognized. It has been an absolutely... Uh, so this started with an email five months ago, I think, by Adam, and it's just been an amazing couple of months working with them. So for all the buzz about making the world a better place, uh, the facts are pretty grim. And if you've read a magazine, if you've read a newspaper, undoubtedly you've heard of it. Um, there's an estimated 1.1 billion people who survive on less than a dollar a day on this earth. So there are about 100 of us present today. If you multiply that, I think, times 10 million, you've just scratched the surface of 1 billion people. It's just an absolutely mind-boggling number. So there are a lot of questions, I think, about um, purchasing power. I know we talk about that in my econ classes. But what does a dollar a day buy in the developing world? Sometimes countries will subsidize things like rice and bread and other staples so that people can buy more. So there were two, uh, which I think it was two or three, it was a group of Claremont McKenna college students who actually decided to go out and experience that. You know, what is it like to live on a dollar a day? So they found that a dollar a day might be enough to survive on. But if you survive, you don't have stand a chance of prospering. You just don't. That's it. One of them came down with E. coli and couldn't work. You're just barely making it in life if you're on a dollar a day. And even on $2 a day, you're do not doing that well either. And uh, that's why I'm here today. I think this represents a major divide in our world. Poverty and prosperity, they separate us from human beings, all of us, into rich people and poor people, the haves and the have-nots. Not only is that absolutely tragic, it's a divide that I think causes a little twinge in the pit of your stomach if you think about this problem for too long. It's the kind of divide that makes you feel bad about every material thing you own. It makes you think about, I have this roof over my head and I know I'm gonna get a well-rounded, nutritious meal tonight. Why did I get that and why didn't someone else get it? That's sad in itself because it makes you feel guilty. But I think the biggest thing about this is that it makes you feel like you can't do anything to help people. I know I kind of just knocked your socks off with how big a billion people really is. And I think a lot of us are asking ourselves, what can we do to make sure that no one has to live in that kind of situation? So without trying to gloss over the statistics, I'm really glad that there is a growing awareness of these kinds of efforts. Destitute poverty has existed basically since the beginning of time. That's the reality, unfortunately. Uh, but honestly, I think it's amazing that there are efforts now to cross it. Right now in human history is just an amazing time to be alive. But the main reason that I'd like to focus on why it's so great to be in this day and age, in this generation, is that it's cool to be socially conscious now. Fair trade products are cool, certain kinds of shoes are cool, and hybrid cars are cool. And the fact that they're so readily available to consume, that shows that there's that kind of demand for these products. People like fair trade. My favorite kind of fair trade soap comes from Target, and I think it's like 10 bucks a bottle. It's like this big, it's made with fair trade coconut oil, and it's absolutely great. So it makes me feel really good to consume fair trade because I know that just by making a slight change in my consumption of something that I have on a regular basis, I've made a slight change. And it's a change I actually feel good about and a change that I really enjoy. The great thing is about this world that we live in today is that it's not the kind of world where one person has to lose for someone else to gain. 
I love my Toms because they're comfortable and they're really cute. Um, my heels are lacking in one of those characteristics. You can decide which. They were off before I came on. Um, but it makes me feel, and seriously, it makes me feel really amazing to know that someone else got a new pair of shoes because I decided to just make a switch. I'm like, OK, ballet flats or Toms? Toms make ballet flats. Yes, great. So it makes me feel good because their feet are now protected from injury and disease just from a little bit of a change in my consumption. Fair Trade's great. All those other products are great. But something that has really always been missing to me is the story of this person that I'm supposedly helping by buying this product. Who are they? What's their name? Do they like their job? Do they have children? What do they do for a living? Is that current occupation that they have something to get by? Or is it their life dream? What do they like to do when they're not working, if they have time? To me, most importantly, what is their end goal? And did my contribution help them get there? I absolutely love people. I love their stories. I love that we got to get up a little bit earlier and talk to each other about, you know, why are you here? Like, what do we have in common? That's awesome to me. That really, really makes being a person really great, these stories. But I feel like if my only contribution to poverty is buying something that helps these people out, I don't feel like I've done something. I don't feel like I've connected with them on a different level. And I don't feel like I've crossed that divide. Maybe I'm crossing a divide by, uh, you know, donating money or buying a certain product that helps certain groups of people, but to me, there's still that divide. I want to know their stories. And I don't want to know their stories so I can just, you know, kind of think about it and feel good about myself and be like, I helped a poor person today. What did you do today? Like, I want to think about them. And I want to think about them the way that I think about my friends and my family as people, because that means a lot to me. And, you know, maybe it's really naive of me, but I think we live in the kind of world where stories can end better than they began. However, I feel, to know, I feel that to know these stories of these people, you have to have a way to interact with them directly. It doesn't just happen. There are ways where you can go on mission trips and you can meet people. But to know the people that you've really helped so directly, you need a way to do that. Interventions by huge organizations can be really helpful, especially in times of disaster or where the situation is so dire that individuals really can't do anything. But there is something in me that just wants to walk up to someone and just say, you know, how are you? Like, what can I do for you? How can we help each other out as people? You know, I don't see you as someone who's poor. I don't see you as someone who is a child that I need to provide for. But I think you're an autonomous adult who has dreams and has desires and has ambitions and has the capability to do that. Until recently, I had no idea how I was going to be able to do that. And it was just this burning desire to do something with absolutely no idea how I was going to do it. I learned about a very direct avenue, though, in one of my classes, which is why college is just absolutely great. And that's called microfinance. And uh, if you haven't heard of microfinance, it provides financial services to the poor and for those who don't have access to traditional banking. So microfinance encompasses a lot of different things. Uh, there's micro savings and there's micro loans. So if I say microfinance at any point, I mean a micro loan. But what is a micro loan? So it's pretty much what it sounds like. It's a very, very, very small loan. In our part of the world, loans are usually in the amounts of like thousands and thousands of dollars. But these micro loans are made in very, very small increments. And uh, the reason why uh, traditional loans aren't necessarily available to the world's poor is because it's just not a practical transaction. You know, you think about that, you're like, well, why don't these big banks go over there and help these people out? Sometimes the potential borrower just doesn't have the collateral to do it. You know, sometimes you'll put up, like, if you take out a car loan, your car's your collateral. I don't see anyone over there owning a car to have the collateral to put that up against. And even if they do, the interest rates are too high to make it practical. So that's where we come in. We have computers. And if we don't have computers, we have internet access and we usually have a credit card, which are two very commonplace objects that I think we really take for granted. You can do quite a bit with those. Uh, one example of a very well-known microfinance institution is Kiva. Through the site Kiva, I, in Towson, Maryland, can lend to whomever I wish an amount starting as low as $25. So let's be real here. College kids are all kinds of broke. I think anyone who is a college student here would agree that $25 does sound a lick a lot of the time. It is pretty manageable, though. And the amazing thing is that you get it back. You're not just playing roulette when you decide to fund a microloan. And you're not just going, OK, let's just see if this works out. These loans have better odds, I think, than any kind of probability game you could play. They have default rates of less than 1%. So I'm not just pulling like, oh, you have a 99% chance of getting it back. You have a 99% chance of getting that loan back. So going back to this obsession I have with people's stories, I think the idea of a loan is really gratifying on both ends of the stick, just because the lender, excuse me, the borrower is given these amazing financial skills and awareness, because now they know how to save, and they know how to pay a loan back on time. And for me, as a college kid, it's really great to have $25 come back that I've already spent. And uh, it's amazing to me, too, because I know that they've succeeded, because that money's come back to me. That, to me, is the end of the story. 
Not necessarily, I can follow up with them, and Keep is a great way to do that, but it's so great because I can follow up. So coming back down to earth, um, I'm not here to tell you that I invented microfinance. Uh, even if I wanted to, the numbers wouldn't quite match up. I couldn't be like, yeah, I totally did that for my dissertation in grad school. I'm an undergrad, and uh, my mom was in elementary school in 1976 when the first loans were funded in Bangladesh, and I uh, definitely didn't come into the picture until much later, circa 1993. So my point is, uh, this is definitely not a new thing. But this is Dr. Muhammad Yunus, who is credited with the idea of microfinance in the first place. He won a Nobel Peace Prize in 2006 for his work. My professors didn't invent microfinance either, but one of them did teach me about it. It was actually a Dr. Seth Gitter's honored seminar in Latin American economics that inspired me and my fellow students to start the Social Entrepreneurs of Towson University. We are aiming to empower up and coming entrepreneurs and to provide opportunities for those who live on less than $2 a day to change their lives and the lives of their children. So speaking of empowerment, I have a story for you. One of the assigned readings in that uh, course that I took included the story of a woman who took out a microloan. I unfortunately don't remember her name, and I don't remember her village, and I couldn't pull the textbook up in time to get this for this presentation. But most importantly, I remember the person that she became because she took out this microloan. So this woman came in to get this loan. I don't really know where she was in the world, but she came in, and I think she looked something like this. She just had her hands crossed and her head down, and she came in, she sat down, and didn't really look at the uh, lender, I'm sure she looked up just to give her word, yes, I'll pay this back and just take the money. And she just kind of scuttled out of her, like she had no business being there. Nothing about her body language said that she thought she'd be able to pay that loan back. I didn't really think she was going to either, honestly, just based on what I saw there. But the lender looked back on her a few months later, and they found that she had paid back her loan, she had taken out several other loans, she had built a bigger house for herself, and she became involved in local politics. Do you think that woman walked anywhere with her head down after that? I don't really think so. So here's a story of a woman whose name I do remember. This is Dionysia. Dionysia is a wife, a mother of five, and the owner of a general store in the Philippines. Dionysia was listed on the site Kiva.org because she wanted a loan of $750 to buy new goods for her general store that she could sell. Uh, the SE team, and I, SE team and I found this loan when it had just barely been funded, right around the time that we decided to apply for TEDx. And about three days later, when we got together to film our application video, it was funded. All of it in its entirety, from like zero to 750. Three days. So those 27 lenders from around the world who I'm pretty sure will never meet each other, all were able to get through and get together with this avenue of microfinance to help Dianita to succeed. Talk about crossing a divide. We don't have to speak the same language or even live in the same hemisphere to work together and fund Dianesia's loan. John Stewart Mill once described enterprise as the desire to keep moving, to be trying, and accomplishing new things for our own benefit or that of others. We know that because Dianesia owns a business and is seeking to expand her business, she's just like any other entrepreneur in the developed world. We, with the 27 other lenders who helped fund this loan, all voted with our money on what we thought she could do, and we think that she can be successful. So, Kiva's full of these kinds of stories. Um, I'm really excited to tell you guys that these pictures that I picked out just a couple days before this presentation were all funded within like 36 hours, all of them. We got them when they were like five or 10%, and it went back and they were entirely funded. Not sure how many people, but these are who the people are. So, there are people in Albania who want to buy more cows for their farms. There are women in Africa who want to buy more medicines for their general stores, not only helping them become more prosperous, but also providing great goods for people to buy in the community, all improving public health overall. There are taxi drivers in Armenia who would like to repair their taxis to keep their business going. And this is a mother in Mongolia who wants to take out a loan to help her daughter pay for tuition. I know as a college student, I really feel an instant connection to someone who's looking for anything related to higher education. You know, your experience going on Kiva is going to be way different from mine because there are things that really make you tick. Like maybe you're really into technology and you want to help someone with, you know, innovation or something for their business. Maybe you're into agriculture and you want to help with that. But these are the ones that stuck out to me and these are the stories that I really felt connected to. And all it took, I didn't fund these loans, but technically that would only take $100 for you to get involved in those four stories and be able to follow those and kind of see where they go. So in a day and age where I think you learn so much about people just from your Facebook profiles, this is so gratifying to me. This really satisfied my curiosity of who is this person and what do they want to do with this loan. I know their name, 
and I know their aspirations. And to me, that really answers the story of who are you and what do you want to do? What do you aspire to? I feel really helpless a lot of times after I make a traditional donation because I feel like I don't know how that person did. I'll never know how they did. But like I said, when that $25 pops back up in your Kiva account a couple, I think it's a couple months later, you'll know that they succeeded, and I think that's really gratifying. So the question is, why is this important? I think this is important because this crosses the divide between loan, lend, excuse me, loan recipients and lenders by creating a community where these lenders and these borrowers can join together and learn about other cultures through the support of loans and by communicating with and observing the loans of other members. I think that this existing divide creates a very, very strong and potentially negative role against the, in the fight against global poverty today. If every solution connected people so directly with each other, what do you think the world would look like? What would you feel like when you were trying to change someone's life? Do you think that we would donate and then kind of feel ourselves sinking when we realize that the problem is really a lot bigger than our resources can do? Do you think we'd feel like we'd made an inadequate contribution? I know that as a college kid, I really feel bad that I don't have billions or thousands or probably even hundreds of dollars to part with to make a lasting change. But the amazing thing is that I think there are solutions to poverty where everyone can benefit. The world can save itself. We're just here to get it started by loaning as little as $25 at a time, crossing the divide between culture, geography, and prosperity. And honestly, this is why I'm here today. I'm 19 years old, um, but to be perfectly honest with you guys, I'm not sure that I'm gonna live to see the end of global poverty. I really, really hope I do. Dr. Eunice um, talks about what the world would be like without poverty, what that would be like. I wanna get back to his picture. He has a really nice smile. Um, it just seems like a nice guy. Here we go. So he talks about what the world would be like. You'd have to go to a museum, pay your fee, get a ticket, and then see what poverty was like. It'd be contained in those little museums. We wouldn't have it. It wouldn't be a thing out in the world. And imagine what that would be like to take your kids to a poverty museum if you have them, or maybe your grandkids. It would be amazing. It really would be. Because my grandfather tells me all the time about what it was like to grow up in the 1940s when the entire world seemed to be at war with each other. I didn't grow up in that kind of world. So, do something with me. Close your eyes. And imagine what it would be like to tell your grandchildren, excuse me, your children and your grandchildren about that thing called poverty that used to be a thing in our world that isn't around anymore. Imagine that. It seems a little unrealistic, but just think about what that would be like if you could do that. Be like, oh yeah, this, this was just a part of history. This is not a part of our present. This is part of our past now. So, open your eyes. I hope I'm not crushing any dreams by saying that microfinance might not be the answer to world poverty. There's no solu perfect solution to anything. But based on what I've seen here this evening, if there is something that could solve world poverty, it's people who feel connected. This is why we're so passionate about crossing this divide. There's an economic prosperity and there's economic poverty and there's a gap between those two things, but we should not have to feel separated. To be perfectly honest, I really don't know if I'll live to see a complete divide or to be a complete crossing of that divide between poverty and prosperity. But I know that I can empower a lot of people by helping feel that they've crossed it. The social entrepreneurs of Towson funded their first loans this past week, and we know that we're on our way to making a change. This organization was an idea five months ago, and now it's on stage at TEDx. Also, 100 of us now have this vision of what it would be like to live in a poverty-free world. I went to Leadership this past January, and I know that a vision can really change anything, and it can go anywhere. I really don't know what avenues that I will take and that you will take to see that this poverty-free world becomes a reality for our children. But I do know that if we create a world in which people can be connected, build relationships, and cross that divide, there is no telling what will happen. Thank you.